The New Orleans Saints now have the best kick return duo in the NFL. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm getting a note. Uh, never mind. You are Locked On Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Huda Nation and Huda family? I am your host, your friend, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credentialed member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as the Saints beat writer over at LouisianaSports.net and Saints analyst over at WWL. TV And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, keep you up to date with all the biggest news from around the New Orleans Saints here over the course of the last day. We'll take a look at an interesting waiver attempt that the New Orleans Saints tried to sign. We'll take a look at the offensive line depth adding a former LSU Tiger. How does it help, if at all, where the offensive line is going into week one? And we're going to kick everything off with Kene Wongwu. That didn't last long. We got that and much more coming up for you on today's episode. We appreciate you very much, as always, for making us your first listen of the day every day and for being an everydayer here on the show, which is a proud part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. So the New Orleans Saints tried to claim running back and return specialist Kenny Wongwu off of waivers earlier this week, but we found out Thursday afternoon that he was waived because of a failed physical and that stinks for the new orleans saints because they were on the verge of having the two best kick returners in the nfl wong Wu and rashid shaheed working with the special teams coordinator and darren rizzi who set all of it up in terms of what the new kickoff return rule looks like all of those pieces it would have been a match made in heaven for this New Orleans Saints team that loves to be able to rely on its special teams unit to be able to help them win games, just like they rely on their defensive unit to help them win games and hopefully offense here in 2024 as well. So this was an unfortunate situation for the New Orleans Saints and truly an unfortunate situation for Kenny Wongwu as well. Just as much as this would have been a big situation and a really nice addition for the New Orleans Saints, this would have been a perfect fit for Wong Wu coming in and being able to land with a team that's pretty set in terms of what it's looking at at running back for right now, but then also being able to land with a team that was going to be able to maximize what he could do as a return specialist. That's a pretty good situation to end up with if you're the guy coming off of, or, or I guess one year removed from, uh, a second team all pro nod as a return specialist joining the team who last year had the player in Rashid Shaheed. They got the first team all pro nod. So it would have been a perfect match for him as well. Now, I will say this doesn't completely close the door on the New Orleans Saints and Kenny Wongwu. This could mean nothing more than he had uh, an existing injury. He did have a back injury last year that kind of ended his season a little bit early. So maybe there's something from that back injury that just wasn't fully healed. And so the Saints ended up not being super comfortable with his medical check. And then if that gets better, then we'll can see where things go at a later time between the team and the player. Or maybe he ends up coming back on a new deal. So instead of them picking up off of waivers and taking on the deal, as it stood from Minnesota, they wanted to be able to not have that deal carry over and instead sign him back with some, you know, uh, stipulation in his contract around his injury, some injury waiver or something like that. That could be a reality as well. Or the New Orleans Saints could say, you know what, it was a good shot, not comfortable with where this all lines up medically. So we're going to move on. This doesn't really hurt the Saints in any way. They didn't make the corresponding move or a second corresponding move along with the trade for defensive tackle, John Ridgeway. They ended up moving on from uh, Kendall Vickers and bringing him back as a defensive tackle to the practice squad. But it's not like they cut a player in addition to that to make room for Wangu and Ridgeway and then only Ridgeway actually joined the team. So they're okay there. And it's not like there's any committed money here because they never got to that point with this being a situation where he failed the physical and then the team ends up just basically sending him back to waivers. And so we'll see if he clears. And then if he clears, then maybe there's an opportunity for the Saints and he to be able to come back together. Maybe they go their separate ways. They don't worry about it. And hopefully, just hopefully, this is nothing more for Wang Wu than some remnant issue or lingering, you know, uh, left to be healed portion of that injury and that it's not something bigger, right? Like we've seen the Saints discover some scary stuff. You think back to John Dornboss and the 
life-threatening heart condition just last year with Foster Moreau and Hodgkin's lymphoma diagnosis. I I assume that if any of that was the case, we would have already heard about it. Like that would have come out before Dennis Allen coming to the podium and saying, hey, he's not joining the team because he failed uh, his physical. So I'm not too concerned with that being the case, but look, we've seen the Saints discover some crazy stuff uh, when it comes to these free agency visits, these medical checks and all these other things. So fingers crossed that's not the case for Wong Wu and that this is just something lingering from maybe the back issue last year or some other issue uh, that ends up maybe just putting him back out on the market for a little bit of time until that's all heared up and then he can pass that medical check. So we'll see if he ends up back in New Orleans. The Saints though at running back are set. Where this really has an impact is on your return specialist side, right? You've got Rashid Shaheed, but you have to have two people back on these kick returns. So who's the second person? My vote, of course, is Taysom Hill because you also, with Taysom, get somebody to where if Taysom's returning, he can return. If Rashid's returning, Taysom can block. Rashid Shaheed's playing up in terms of his weight. He's up over 180 pounds for like the first time in terms of his, uh, or 190 pounds, excuse me, uh, for the first time in like his playing career entirely. So uh, this is all good for both of these guys. And they should be able to kind of split a bit of the roles of being able to be a returner or a blocker, depending upon who the ball goes to, which side ends up being there, who ends up getting the call, all those other pieces. So that's going to be interesting just to see if they do something a little bit different than we expect a kick returner. And it's not Rashid Shahid and Taysom Hill. Then maybe it's Rashid Shahid and Alante Taylor or Rashid Shahid and Jordan Mims or the other folks on the active roster that we've seen already return kicks for the team over the course, like training camp and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, they've got the talent there to be able to do it. It's just not the same two outstanding kick returners and being able to say, yeah, the best kick return tandem in the NFL. It's not that as of right now, but I'll tell you what, Taysom Hill's pretty dang good. Pretty dang good. Um, At running back, what this means is that you don't have an overflowing room of four running backs and you don't have to make a decision about whether or not you wanted to carry Jordan Mims or Kenny Wongwu. It also keeps you from having to make the decision between Kenny Wongwu and maybe a player at the bottom of another position or something like that. And so you get to roll with Alvin Kamara with Jamal Williams, with Jordan Mims, as intended going into the beginning of the season, and then see what these guys have the ability to do. I expect that Alvin Kamara will see what happens with his contract situation before the season begins. Uh, I'm actually going to come back to that when I answer some questions at the end of the show. Uh, But I I expect that he's going to see the bulk of the carries, but a lesser bulk than what we've seen over the course of the past few years, because he won't have to be the guy that runs in between the tackles. He can be the guy that's focused on getting outside while Jamal Williams also gets outside, but focuses between the tackles, plus Taysom Hill out of the backfield. And then now you've got Jordan Mims. I can do a little bit of both of those things too. And so I would expect that like, I wouldn't be surprised if Alvin Kamara gets 50% of the snaps while Jamal Williams gets, you know, 30% of the snaps and um, Jordan Mims gets, you know, 20% of the snaps or or something like that. You know what I mean? Like something that kind of degrades from Alvin Kamara's usage down to Jamal Williams usage down to Jordan Mims usage. And so Kenny Wongwu being in that mix wouldn't have had a huge impact if we're being honest, because it's not really the position that you sign him for. Uh, But just so that the point is clear with him being what would have been a fourth running back in the room depending on their corresponding move at that point, the Saints are going to be right where they were at running back with him or without him. Alvin Kamara, Jamal Williams, Jordan Mims, not a lot to worry about there, but could be an interesting one to continue to watch over the coming days. But um, also, will the New Orleans Saints go back to the to the market for another return specialist at some point? Uh, that's a lot of stuff that we'll be able to keep an eye out on uh, that this very interesting waiver claim kind of gave us to look at. All right, coming up next, New Orleans Saints going to... Uh, uh, an LSU Tiger to find their next uh, piece of the offensive line depth. Where is the offensive line? How comfortable are we feeling about it? And who's playing where? We got all that coming up for you next as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends at 5-Hour Energy. What is 5-Hour Energy, you ask? You know what 5-Hour Energy is. It's a little, little little shots to give you 5 hours of energy. What a question. I thought you'd be better than that. No, I'm just kidding. 5-Hour Energy is absolutely awesome. It's the brand that busy, hardworking people know and love and have turned to for over 20 years to get that energy 
energized, alert feeling that they need to be able to get the job done. You always know where to find five hour energy shots. They're available at registers across grocery stores nationwide for your convenience. But now you can also stockpile on money saving multi packs to make sure that you always have that delicious, energizing five hour energy shot to turn to. If you go to fivehourenergy.com right now, that's the number five hour energy.com to get some five hour energy products today. Use the promo code locked on F. B, like football, FB, to receive 20% off of your purchase. This offer is valid only through September 30th and cannot be used with any other promos as well. And this code does not work on subscription orders. Go to 5hourenergy.com. All right, family, the New Orleans Saints add an offensive lineman to their practice squad, but still have not touched the active roster. Are they going to be okay on the offensive line? And how can the former LSU Tiger Austin Deculus uh, end up impacting this team? We're going to break it all down here as we continue on with today's episode. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out Locked On Fantasy Football. Get the fantasy football advice that you need every Monday through Friday, 30 minutes a day, free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Go and check them out. Part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So the New Orleans Saints signed an offensive lineman. Are you excited? Are you excited? Well, they didn't sign one to their active roster, but they signed one to the practice squad that has the ability to be able to contribute from a depth perspective. I don't think that you're going to be looking at much changing when it comes to the active roster or the starters on the offensive line. We're going to get to a couple of your questions on that here in just a second. But adding Austin Deculus does give them the number that they like. The addition of Austin Deculus gives the team eight offensive linemen on their active roster and four offensive linemen on their practice squad. This is uh, Austin Deculus in addition to Josiah Zerum and others that have been able to come back to their practice squad. One of the things that Dennis Allen said the other day during his press conference was that they really like having somewhere between 12, between 10 to 12, oh my gosh, somewhere between 10 to 12 um, offensive linemen on their kind of combined active roster and practice squad. They now have that. So that's where the Austin Deculus situation helps you quite a bit, right? Because it gets you to the number that you're looking for. Now, the 6'5", 320 pounder is also a very athletic player, right? Scored very high on all of his athletic metrics when it came to, uh, you know, the, the combine. Maybe missed a little bit on what the RAS composite or the relative athletic score composite would call you know, agility ratings, but that's all right. Uh, Moved well, I think ran a 508 40, so a pretty good 40 for a guy his size, actually a very good 40 for a guy his size. So he adds a little bit of speed, brings some impact as well. Somebody that has experience playing tackle positions, everything has experience playing on the interior when needed as well. And so he just gives you another one of those versatile pieces that's able to come in and just bring some athleticism. And, And I think that that's the biggest thing. You look at, you know, the fact that he was with the New York Giants most recently, um, that's, or excuse me, New York Jets most recently, that is uh, a system that has had and has had some overlap in terms of what the Saints coaching staff is, right? Remember John Benton used to be a New York Jets guy until he was away for that year and then ended up, you know, kind of hitting the market again and all that other stuff and then finding his way back to New Orleans. Now, Deculus and Benton didn't overlap in, in anything, but in terms of the system and the scheme and things like that, not too much has terribly changed uh, in terms of what John Benton would know about him coming from New York and all that and probably has some, you know, contact with people who are like, hey, what do you think about this guy? Like making those phone calls, all that. So a little bit of that connective tissue at work in the sort of behind the scenes dealings of getting Austin Deculus to New Orleans, I would imagine. Now, here's something that's pretty interesting here. Um, Austin Deculus makes 17 on the Saints 16 man practice squad. So what that tells us is that Charlie Smith, New Orleans Saints rookie kicker that came in from Ireland on the international pathway program uh, for players that come in from outside the States, he is very likely a roster exemption, meaning that he doesn't count against the team's 
active roster, nor does he count against a team's 16-man practice squad. It effectively gives them a 17th practice squad spot. However, they won't be able to call on him, right? If he's a roster exemption, I think in order for them to actually be able to utilize him, they'd have to cut him, get him through waivers again, and then bring him back. And so I believe that's the way that that would work. Um, and so you can't just say, all right, well, now you're up, you know, if there's anything there. But there are mechanisms by which I'm sure if anything happened to Blake Groupie this season and the Saints wanted to turn to Charlie Smith or needed to turn to Charlie Smith, that they could make that happen. But it wouldn't be as simple as, all right, well, you're activated and you're on the active roster now. So that gave us a little bit of a clue with Austin Dickless being the 17th practice squad member that Charlie Smith was indeed on that roster exemption. Um so what about the offensive line? And I've, I've got a couple of questions here from, from folks uh, that sent some in, that sent in some questions. And one of the big ones was, you know, who who's playing where, right? Who should we expect to see on the New Orleans Saints offensive line? And, and I, look, I think this is where the team still needs help, right? So you add Austin Deculus and you help out, help yourself out in terms of depth. Sure, it's a numbers game. You have the number of players that you want. I, I respect all that. But do we know if the Saints have the right starting five as of right now? And is there anything that they're going to be able to do about it if they don't have that? So that's where I think more help is necessary, right? Building up that immediate depth on your active roster and potentially being ready to address your starting tackle situation, right? The San Francisco 49ers just extended Brandon Ayuk. What's going to happen with Trent Williams? Pie in the sky idea, but that's probably the best shot you have at landing a starter that can go onto your offensive line somewhere, whether it be at left tackle, then moving Fuanga back over to right tackle or whatever. That's really your best shot potentially at landing a starter. Like that's, and, and when I say that, what I mean by that is that you have to go to extreme lengths in order to find that person. So that's why I think the Saints still need to bolster what their on active roster depth looks like. And maybe if you have a healthy Nick Saldaveri, that might end up helping there. So my expectation in terms of who starts on the offensive line has not changed. As of right now, you've got Taliesi Fong at left tackle. You've got Lucas Patrick at left guard, Eric McCoy at center, Cesar Ruiz at right guard, and then Trevor Pitting at right tackle. Will it stay that way for the entirety of 17 games? There's the question. Ah, there's the rub in my old Shakespearean past. So that becomes the, the big thing. So where do you make changes? Well, Ali Udo feels like the next in line at right tackle. Landon Young feels like the next in line at many of the guard spots, as well as potentially the left tackle spot. And then Nick Saldaveri, if healthy, feels like he's in line for any of the other pieces. The thing that's really interesting, and that includes center, by the way, because he played center at the Senior Bowl. And so there's an opportunity maybe there for him. But the thing that I do kind of appreciate is that the Saints actually have three starting center options on their starting roster between Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, and Lucas Patrick. They could always turn to one of those guys as well. As much as I'm always anti-impacting your roster in two spots, only one spot needs to be impacted kind of a thing. But, you know, look, this is this is what the Saints do, right? Um, the other question that I had is, are we confident in the offensive line? And right now, like, how, really, how much confidence should we feel in the offensive line I, I, is, is the more appropriate question here, um, or the question being asked. And I, I would say that if I were you, like I would go in skeptical. I, I really would. And I'm not trying to down talk. I'm not trying to beat up. I'm not trying to like be negative or anything like that. Y'all know that's not my game. Even though I picked the Saints, you know, to to struggle this year. We'll see how things go. I'm just I just want to see the offense work. And a lot of that comes down to this offensive line. And so I would be skeptical. Like I would come in with a little bit of a side eye. Like what y'all gonna do? You know what I'm saying? Because like I do think that that's appropriate for right now because we just don't know. Like it doesn't make sense to go in and say, yeah, they're going to be this great offensive line and rah, rah, like they're going to be so good. Like the scheme is going to help them out and all this stuff. Like, okay, well, what happens on third and nine? You know what I mean? Can, can the offensive line keep Derek Carr clean in those situations? Like to me, that's got to be the biggest thing. So I would go in skeptical, a little bit of side eye, a little bit of like what you're going to do and then wait to see what happens. I think you're better off being surprised than disappointed uh, when it comes to this offensive line. All right, coming up next, uh, I want to dive into uh, the Saints making an interesting waiver claim that might have completely shaken up their cornerback room. We got that coming up for you next as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The same formula for winning championships is the formula that will also help you keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to be able to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak 
performance, superchargers, roof racks, LED headlights, exhaust kits, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for at ebaymotors.com. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, that part is guaranteed to fit every time or your money back because the eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, you get to make your car an MVP and bring home some huge wins. Head over to Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Let's get it, Huda Nation. The New Orleans Saints almost completely shook up their cornerback room after setting their initial 53 and keeping guy who's become a fan favorite, Enrico Payton. He could have been out the door if the New Orleans Saints would have landed this player. We appreciate you very much for being here with us for another episode of Locked on Saints. We will be back with you on Monday, getting back to our regularly scheduled programming episode in the morning. And then we'll have uh, DA, we'll have some press conferences, things like that on Monday. We're moving into game week. So I'll come back, do a live show to get you ready for everything. I think I'm just going to stick with two days through most of the season. There are probably going to be some days where I'm going to say, look, y'all, like Tuesdays, I'll probably just do one episode, but because there's typically not practice and stuff like that. But I think I'm just going to keep doing two days. I really enjoyed it. Y'all have really enjoyed it as well. You seem to have really enjoyed it. And so why not keep going? You know what I'm saying? So we're just going to keep it moving here throughout. And hopefully we'll have a whole bunch to talk about for this New Orleans Saints team. And one of the things that was really interesting that just happened recently, because this team never just kind of plays it right down the way that you expect it, right? They're always kind of looking at little different ways to grab, improve, tinker, do all this other stuff. Well, they showed a little bit of that. They were one of four teams to put a waiver claim in on uh, cornerback Shamar Bartholomew, who was with the New York Jets, another New York Jets connection, was with the New York Jets over the course of the offseason here and performed extremely well, extremely well throughout the preseason. Uh, one of the better cornerbacks in the league, much like Rico Payton, much like Shamar John Charles, much like Ray John Wright, who also had a really strong preseason, uh, who ended up on injured reserve. His season is over dealing with a turf toe injury. Uh, but you know, it's been a lot going on in terms of how the Saints have built out their their cornerback room. Now, curiously, Shamar John Charles has not made it back to the act to the practice squad, which is 100% what we expected to happen. And so the Saints have no corners on their practice squad right now. So there is that to watch. But they did try to clave Shamar Bartholomew. They were one of four teams. It was the in priority order, right? So I'm going to give you this in order, which waiver priority order is based on kind of league finish at the end of last year. So the worst team in the NFL, worst record in the NFL has the highest waiver priority. Super Bowl winner has the lowest waiver priority. So running number one, top priority, number 32, lowest priority. And so the Carolina Panthers who owned not the number one overall pick because they traded it last year, but they did own that number one position as the worst team in the league last year. They had put in a waiver claim. They were awarded Shamar Bartholomew, the six foot, nearly 200 pound corner. Um, They were awarded him because they had the highest priority. Los Angeles Chargers had the fifth highest priority, also drafted fifth last year or this year in the draft. They put in a waiver claim. The Saints, who were 14th, put in a waiver claim. And then the Kansas City Chiefs, who were 32nd, who had to know going into this one, like, nah, we'll just try it. We'll see what happens. You know what I mean? It's like the episode of The Office where Oscar wins because everyone voted for him thinking that no one else was going to vote for him and it would increase their chances of winning. That's the Kansas City Chiefs in this one. That is a niche reference, but I hope you enjoy it. Um, So I... I look at the Saints there and I go, huh, interesting that they even put a waiver claim in because they already have Marshawn Lattimore, Paul Sinadibo, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Alante Taylor, not necessarily in that order, but you know, your starters of Lattimore, Adibo, Taylor, and then you have Kool-Aid McKinstry who you just drafted. Those four guys were never going anywhere. Rico Payton, they were really worried about him not making it through waivers. I think that this claim and the number of teams that put in a claim on Shamar Bartholomew, who allowed only a 39.3 or 39.6. Uh, passer rating over the course of the preseason on nine targets where he allowed zero receiving yards. One of the other better corners in the NFL during the preseason was Rico Payton. Three, uh, 13 targets, the most of the first two games, only three catches allowed and then allowed a uh, passer rating of just over 60. And so like 
I think the Saints' logic was sound on that one, that they weren't sure they were going to be able to get Rico Payton through waivers. Um, and they clearly probably wouldn't have. And so they ended up keeping him. So those are your five corners right there. And you've got five really good, talented players right there. It's a really deep room if what Rico Payton showed during the preseason can be 80% of what he is during the regular season, right? Uh, you know, look, you're talking about better competition levels, all these other things. And so, but like, if he's that, then you're set. So where does Shamar Bartholomew come in? Do you just keep six really strong, talented corners? I mean, that feels like something the New Orleans Saints would do. But then where do you lose a number, right? Do you go down to five receivers in that case? Do you go down one more defensive lineman because of that case, which would or in that case, which would have been really tough because you're carrying Colin Saunders onto the roster who is dealing with an injury. Uh, maybe you could have moved DeMarco Jackson or Jalen Ford, depending upon who needs it, to injured reserve if you needed to, since the Saints have six linebackers and a couple of them are dealing with injury. So there's like other places where they could have been able to make that move, but it was just really interesting. Because it's like, okay, so what do you feel like you're missing in that cornerback room? But this is so New Orleans, right? This is so the New Orleans Saints and Dennis Allen and Joe Woods and uh, uh, Marcus Robert Robertson, who just continue to stockpile talented corners over and over and over again um, and never be mad at it. So it's interesting. Like, could they have kept six really talented corners in that situation uh, would have been really, really interesting to see, or if they would have maybe moved on from Rico Payton. I don't know, but um, I'm glad that Rico Payton is still on the roster uh, because I, I think he's a really, really talented player and I'm very excited to see him. All right. I got a couple of questions from folks that I just want to answer. Some of them are a little basic and, and a little bit like review worthy, but I think that they're important ones to keep in mind as we head into practice week next week. So I'm going to kind of rapid fire my way through five, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five questions. And then I'll give you the answers that I'm thinking. Uh, the first question is, uh, will Alvin Kamara sign before week one? I don't know. <laughs> it's not a great answer. I know. What I do know though, is my understanding and, and a lot of people's understanding is that the Saints put an offer down on the table for Alvin Kamara. Don't know how much, don't know, you know what the give and take was in terms of the negotiations, uh, but that contract has yet to be signed. So I take that to mean that there's some things in there that Alvin Kamara and his team are not ready to accept yet. So I assume that they will continue to go through, but I will say this, the fact that the Saints put an offer on the table shows interest from the Saints. Alvin Kamara has very vocally stated his interest to stay with the Saints. Typically speaking, typically speaking, when both parties are interested, they'll work out a deal. So we'll see if they get that done. Will it be before the week one game though? That part is the one that I'm not sure of, but that's okay. Um, even if it goes into the beginning of the season, like we've seen the Saints do this over and over again. Cam was like right before the season. Carl Granderson was in season. Demario Davis was in season. Marshall Lattimore was in season. You know, just because week one starts doesn't mean that they stop with those negotiations. That can continue to go. Uh, who's going to start at safety? Also a very good question. It still could be Jonathan Abram. It still could be Will Harris. It still could be Jordan Howden. I think if I'm selecting between those three, I go Jonathan Abram. If I'm selecting between the two that are on the active roster, I kind of lean Will Harris. Um, I just think that Jordan Howden's value is away from the line of scrimmage. I think Jordan Harris has, I mean, excuse me, Will Harris has a little bit more experience playing closer to closer to the line of scrimmage and down in the box. And I think that's what's going to complement the Honey Badger and Tyron Matthew the most. But if they want to actually start using Tyron Matthew closer to the line of scrimmage, then Jonathan Abram is, is excuse me, Jordan Howden is perfect to have away from the line of scrimmage. Uh, what should we expect from Jordan Mims? I think I kind of mentioned that earlier. Sorry, I'm repeating a question here, but I think you're expecting him to maybe get you know, around 15% of snaps in the early going and then see if he grows from there and then see where things go. The good news about Jordan Mims though too is that he's also a very good pass protector or has proven to be a solid pass protector for the Saints so far. So that will help him get out on the field. Will Marshawn Lattimore start week one? Yes, it does seem that that's the case. He, Kool-Aid McKintry, Rashid Shahid, all back at practice over the course of these last couple of days during bonus week. So I expect to see Marshawn Lattimore out there all throughout this week leading into the week one game. And finally, how important is this year for Dennis Allen? I think it is very, very important. If you ask him, of course, every year is important. I respect that line of thinking. But this season is particularly important. Remember what we talked about last year, right? Dennis Allen got his quarterback. And what we talked about was he's going to get two years with this quarterback, no matter what, no matter what happened last year, he was always going to get a second year. That's always the thing. Once the head coach gets his quarterback, he gets two years with that quarterback to try to swing things around. Uh, if they're not able to swing things around, if they miss the 
playoffs for the fourth year in a row for the first time since the Jim Hazlitt area, then I think things become a little tough uh, for Dennis Allen and his future projection with the team. However, I don't know that there is a head coach replacement on this team, right? A lot of people toss around the idea of Clint Kubiak. I don't know that Clint Kubiak's that guy. I think he's a great offensive coordinator, but don't know if he's a head coach just yet. Um, And so based on that, where do you go? And so there could be some interesting things that end up happening there because if you add a head coach, is he going to work with the same offensive coaching staff or are you revamping your coaching staff entirely again? That's where things get really, really challenging uh, in terms of the Saints' decision-making on if they want to move on and change head coaches. All right. We appreciate you very much. As always, make a Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out Locked on Pelicans and Locked on LSU. And thank you very much for making us a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me on the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. If you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. They're not a family. Zoom them on how you live and let me know how you're moming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you. 